Okay, good morning. This is Richard Shu, host of Shu Untied. Uh, this morning, I'm very pleased to have with me as my guest, Jerry Koo, who's a partner at Gunderson Detmer. Jerry, welcome to the program. Thank you, Richard. Glad to be here. So, Jerry, I, let me start by asking you um, how a biology major uh, decides to become a lawyer. Yeah, I think um, biology really comes from, um, you know, I come from a family of physicians. Uh -huh. So that was the natural path as a young person. Say, hey, I want to be doing what my father and uncles are doing. Uh -huh. College was when I really discovered my own uh, you know, passions and, and you know, uh, aptitude and also receive encouragement from professors. Huh. Think about, you know, pursuing uh, something in the humanities. Oh, uh, interesting. Gradually, that um, was the direction I took. Uh, and I will also mention I double majored in both biology and philosophy um, in college. So there was a lot of exposure to the humanities sides of things. Hmm. Um, hmm. I think at the time there was a little bit of trepidation as a first generation immigrant to really pursue kind of law, legal, mm -hmm. you know, things having to do with uh, language as its mm -hmm. foundation. Mm -hmm. And just didn't think it was um, an opportunity or it's available to somebody like me. Mm -hmm. And I received a lot of encouragement. Hmm. What, um, what ultimately prompted you to, to make the plunge and do the law school thing? Um, I think I always wanted to do good for the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, or systematic, broader scale, mm. uh, whereas um, pursuing, you know, medicine would have been, in my mind at the time, more of a one-on-one -on -one kind of one person at a time. Um, so that was really the original thinking that, mm -hmm. hey, I wanted to make an impact mm. on a broader scale mm. rather than kind of one person at a time. But the irony is that now, 20 years into doing this, it really is a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, <laughs> one entrepreneur, one investor, one company at a time. And over time, you do see that change, do yeah. see kind of making an impact and difference. Yeah, yeah. Well, when you went to law school, did you know you were going to become a startup venture capital lawyer? Or what, were your, what was your thinking when you first went to law school? Uh, I was thinking of becoming a litigator. Uh-huh. I think that's what we see in uh -huh. the media. That's yeah. what we thought would be, hey, that's kind of how you make an impact as a lawyer. Yeah. So it never really, this whole notion of, hey, you can be a transactional lawyer um, really was something that developed over the course of, you know, being in law school and uh, summer opportunities. Yeah, right. Well, what drew you what drew you to becoming a transactional lawyer and specifically, you know, working with startups? Um, so I was really fortunate that at the time I grew up in Texas, mm -hmm. but family relocated to the Bay Area after mm -hmm. I headed off to college. Mm -hmm. And so coming to the Bay Area was a natural choice for me just based on, you know, family location. And then being here, that's when I got the exposure to mm -hmm. start up. And even then, as a summer associate, the thinking still was, maybe I'll do IP litigation or mm -hmm. be some sort of litigator. Mm -hmm. But being in the environment is when you see the difference makers are people helping startups to bring ideas to reality and getting yeah. that financed, funded and looking for an exit. Uh, and so it really took being here, being in the environment to connect the dots that, hey, I can be a litigator basically anywhere, but if I'm going to be in Silicon Valley, that's the difference maker yeah. in, this, in this market, in this environment. Interesting. Well, tell me a little bit about the book that you wrote, The Startup Legal Guide. What, um, what motivated you to do that book? Writing a book is always a daunting task. Yeah, I would chalk that up a little bit to this whole notion of, hey, making a difference and also never having been an author of a book, mm. underestimating how daunting it really is. 
<laughs> um, but the idea really came to me, uh, and it's a book that I co-author with at the time, general counsel of a venture fund client. Mm -hmm. And that idea started um, when I first moved out to China to start the Beijing office for the firm. Mm -hmm. And that was a greenfield. We came across a ton of entrepreneurs, a ton of entrepreneur turned VCs, mm. a lot of uh, junior investors first getting into the business. Mm. Um, and so the thinking really was, hey, we want to educate the market um, and put something together as a tool book to level the playing field a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. At the time, out in the Asia market, the typical approach is that folks put more premium on getting to a signed term sheet and then look for a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Then the deal becomes real. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that also means a lot of deal parties will have signed up to terms just based on templates and mm -hmm. they don't understand what the term sheet is saying. Um, and that leaves everybody less well off. I think even for folks that have terms in the term sheet that ends up favoring them, they don't really have the knowledge or uh, the moral high ground to say, hey, this is the reason this makes sense because mm -hmm. people were just so used to signing up to templates. Yeah. And so the book really is designed, we thought, to put it out there and um, let people see the different formulations and options. We try mm -hmm. not to be you know, didactic or put it forth as, hey, this is the best practice and you should be doing these. Yeah. Let people see the optionality of various terms. Mm -hmm. And let's get a little bit more detailed into what the terms mean and mm -hmm. how they impact in a real dollar and economic sense. Mm -hmm. So the book is written for non-lawyers. It's meant for, and for specifically like first time entrepreneurs who are doing a financing. It really is meant to be read side by side as a reference to for someone who has received a term sheet. I see. And yeah, it, right. Like, oh my gosh, I don't even know how to begin to evaluate this. Do mm -hmm. I need to Google everything? You know. Mm -hmm. And it really the design was to make it as user friendly in a dictionary format almost to. Yeah. These are the things that you're looking at. And I will also say back when we developed the idea, um, the short form term sheet was not really as widely adopted as right now. So people are really at the time signing up to detailed term sheets mm. where we get to the long form documents, then they understand what they actually signed up to. What's up really on our back foot as far as, you know, try to renegotiate it or try to make it more friendly uh, or a mutual beneficial type of arrangement rather than one yeah. side. Yeah. Do you find yourself referencing the book a lot or sending the book to clients or, you know, using it somehow in your day to day? Um, I think the book itself um, came together under you know, what was really prevalent at the time. And it is more directed towards Asian market. Mm -hmm. um, I have moved back and practiced full time here in the Bay Area uh, mm -hmm. since 2018. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the terms and provisions are a little bit more tailored to mm -hmm. what was going on in the Asia region. Mm -hmm. um, but coming back here, I have found a lot of those terms have, you know, made their way back to the States mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, some of the terms that practicing over there, I thought are more sort of market culture fit over there turns out to be things that folks have wanted all along. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It's that evolution that, you know, we really ought to think about writing a second edition to the book. To keep <laughs> up. Well, I, I was just going to ask you, is, the, is that in the works at all, a, a revision or a second edition? Um, I think 
here for the U.S., yeah, it would need to be majorly revamped for uh -huh, the uh -huh. target audience. Um, one thing that perhaps you know we didn't get into a ton of detail in the first edition, given that the target audience is mostly outside of the U.S. at the yeah. time, was that we didn't go into a lot of the uh, you know, U.S. tax consequences of things. Mm -hmm. the target audience was, for the most part, non-U.S. taxpayers. Mm -hmm. uh, but here it's critically important, right? Whether, uh, you know, qualify small business, what ISOs, ENSOs, those are all top of mind for entrepreneurs here. Yeah, yeah. We'll barely touch on and only for purpose of, at the time, there were quite a few returnees from the U.S. who are U.S. taxpayers with green cards or whatnot. And so we do mention various places in the first edition that, hey, these are things that will just flag for you, but you really ought to talk to U.S. tax advisors about it if it's mm -hmm. applicable to you. But yeah. you keep balance to issue spot, kind of flag issues, potential issues while keeping it generally applicable to the target audience. Yeah, right. Well, now that you move back to the Bay Area, are you here permanently or might you move back to China at some point or what is your long term plan? I'm definitely here, here. Um, I think the initial move out there was I'm ethnically Chinese um, by, you know, born and grew up in Taiwan. So mm. China, the first extended exposure was the assignment to go out there and start the office. Um, but the plan was always to come back. And I, I see. I think I spent a full five years out there um, yeah. and the office is uh, still robust, still going strong. And so I view that uh, a little bit as mission accomplished. Yeah. But personally, yeah, it's uh, Baria is where I'm from and looking to uh, stay here for the long haul. Yeah. Well, Jerry, really appreciate your taking the time. It's been wonderful chatting with you. If you do decide to uh, write that second edition of that book, please come back and tell me about it. Yeah, absolutely. This is Richard Shu and Jerry Koo. Thanks. Thank you.